So yeah, thanks so much for um, offering to do this. Um, we absolutely um, have loved listening to both um, yours and uh, Michael Sugru's lectures, um, especially uh, with the, um, the, the, the the Q and A as well that uh, Michael also um, offered to do with us as well. It's just um, I, w one of the things I, I really appreciate about both of your lecture style is that um, you're able to maintain a um, a real sort of transparency when you're lecturing about um, someone. Uh, you lecture from um, their point of view. Um, how, how do you how do you maintain that level of um, transparency when when you're um, even sort of approaching reading a, a text? How do you how do you go about it with an open mind? Well, there, there's there's several quote tricks. Um, one is to know a little bit about the historical moment, right? To understand the challenges and situations that that author or or person uh, was confronted with the sort of universe of discourse that they were uh, accustomed to. So that's one. Um, the second, and I think this used to be universal, is the uh, principle of charity. That you, every prince, every time you are confronted with an argument position or, um, or philosophy, uh, you interpret it in the in the most charitable way possible, so such that it makes the most possible sense. In other words, you try to sort of help the author out, um, and that's not necessarily the most accurate view, but that is likely to be the view that the uh, the author had. After that, you can of course bring in current concerns. You can bring in ask whether the uh, assumptions and presuppositions that you made to be charitable um, are um, adequate. In other words, I charitably understand this author's perspective. That doesn't mean that I necessarily share it, but you can't uh, hope to criticize um, in, a, in a thoughtful and, a, and a productive fashion until you understand. And you can't understand until you put your, as it were, put yourself in their shoes and then interpreted that perspective uh, with the principle of charity. So, I mean, there's a lot of other things you do too, but if you do those two, you're going to be okay. Mm, mm, definitely. I think, um, uh, just by the way, if, if anyone else wants to ask a question, please just um, either yeah, sure. on, on Zoom, you can raise your hand or just <clears throat> unmute. Um, in, in sort of, uh, debates that I've I've listened to recently in, on, on on YouTube and this kind of thing. There's this principle um, that's that's come up uh, called steel manning, um, where instead of making a straw man like an uncharitable um, view of your opponent's um, argument, you, you you try and make the, the strongest uh, case yeah. um, uh, um, for that for their argument. And I think um, we're we're starting to see um, the. Uh, uh, more and more of these sort of like um, straw mans, especially because of stuff like social media, like Twitter, all, all, all the sort of um, <laughs> arguments that are um, sort of uh, put across there. Um, how would you say? Um, how do you how do you come to a, a conclusion about um, to these these, these uh, a philosopher um, that's that's um, based on if if you're if you're going to um, make the most charitable argument for them. How, how do you bring um, that to a, to a conclusion? That's a really good question. Um, so one, once you have charitably understood them, um, then you've taken the first step. Uh, once you've placed them in their context, you have that, you've completed that first step. The second step is, and this is a very liberating thing, is to say, okay, were there other voices available at the time, other perspectives engaging in the same topic in question? And how did they see it? And that really enriches your perspective because, you know, let's say you're, you're talking about, um, you know, Rousseau on the social contract and you've charitably understood it. You see it from his perspective. You understand the context in which he's acting and you can um, render a fairly, as you said, a, a steel man um, account of it, then the next question is, okay, what did other people say at the time? So that may be, well, what did Delon think? What did Voltaire think? 
What did uh, what did the the fans of Jacques Necker think about questions of social contract and general will? How was it treated differently in, say, Diderot than in um, Rousseau? And then go even farther afield. And what did um, what did British thinkers think? What did John Millar think? What did uh, David Hume think? Adam Smith, um, Bolingbroke, uh, 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 Berg. Uh, and then that gives you a wider um, uh, sort of perspective within which to place your, your uh, charitably understood set of doctrines. So that's the next step. And then finally, after that, you begin to say, okay, and what would people from a totally different culture zone say? Or a totally different time? And then when that's all done, you're in a position to finally say, okay, and how do I feel about this? And what's my reaction? But until you have the others, if you start with your feeling and reaction, you tend to build up a straw man and spin your wheels. And your critiques are sincere, but they're not particularly trenchant because you haven't really you haven't really engaged with with the um, uh, with the doctrine or the philosopher with, with great care. When you have, it's still entirely possible to say, look, I've read this guy, it's brilliant, it's wonderful, it's fantastic. I think it's a load of nonsense. That's fine. Um, but only after you've understood it, seen why it's attractive, can account for why it's attractive, and then can say why you think it's, it, it, it's rubbish. But remember, when you say it's rubbish, you're already acknowledging, this is very intelligent rubbish, this is very important rubbish, this is very um, influential rubbish, and it's rubbish that everyone should read. But nonetheless, I disagree with it for the, these particular reasons. And that, that seems to me to be um, the trick to be able to both understand something on its own terms and then um, place it within your own understanding and, and, and make a, a critique of it. So, I mean, it, as intellectual historians, that's generally where we start with is with understanding it internally, what Robin Collingwood said, get on the inside of the idea. Um, for many, that's where they stop and that's fine. I mean, it's, it's a, an admirable piece of work to just explicate um, a doctrine, uh, a discourse, um, a language game. Um, but, I don't think you have to stop there. I don't think it, there's anything illegitimate in then being able to criticize. I do think there is something somewhat illegitimate in criticizing without doing first the hard work of the charitable reading and understanding. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. How did you want to ask? Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, Darren. Um, yeah, just on that point of um, charitable reading, I'm wondering if you've ever encountered a thinker who you didn't feel you were able to give that to them because it was so out there or or maybe <laughs> or maybe it was more the most difficult one you had that, that experience with <laughs> uh, i've had some where it's not easy <laughs> to, to to charitably get in, inside um but that's the challenge um i don't think i've ever found one that i couldn't um mostly because you know, over the long durée, very few, th I mean, there are things that survive that are crazy and wicked, but rarely that are just kind of like head-scratchingly dumb. Um, time tends to, 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 to kill those down. Um, so as a result, um, I, I haven't found anything yet that I, you're just like, I, I, I can't grapple with this at all. I mean, there's some things you read and it's, you know, I, I have to work hard because it's kind of distasteful. Um, even so, uh, again, I, I'm in a special position. This is my professional training. <laughs> it's sort of, you know, I'm, I'm an, as, as it were, an archaeologist of, of old thoughts. <laughs> so, um, you know, e e even if I find them nutty, I find very often I find the nuttiest ones really interesting. It's like discovering a very strange uh, hidden culture that no one had seen before. Um, but I, my, where I think you see guys, you know, what we in the States would call flaming um, arguments, it's often because they're fairly recent. And um, as a result, it is, 
it's somewhat easier, I think, for someone who is upset with, with what they're presented with to say, well, this is all rubbish. And the intuition isn't crazy because it hasn't lasted the, the length, the, the, uh, the stretch of time. And so your feeling is this is such rubbish. I need to warn people to not start elevating this, moving it up. Um, and I think when you see the sort of, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe it's slightly different on your side of the pond, but when you see the really vituperative arguments, it often is directed towards much more recent stuff, which has not yet, you know, sifted through. So, you know, basically um, people are trying to forestall it, um, um, lodging into the, uh, you know, to the collective high cultural psyche, as it were. So, yeah, there are, look, there are some things that are, um, you know, I, I happen to personally love reading Nietzsche, but there are some things in there that are really distasteful, that are really, you know, look at this carefully. This is really nasty and ugly. When he says, you know, the future uh, um, liberated man um, will commit hideous crimes. And, you know, it's good. And it's like, they actually did. And it wasn't so good. And, <laughs> you know, you, you know, I don't think Frederick Nietzsche was someone who wanted to see mass butchery. I don't think so at all. But it's a, a moment like that when you're reading him and you're trying to appreciate why he's saying this. And there are good reasons for him to say it, good reasons for him to believe it. But at the same time, you, you do step back and say, yeah, but I mean, you're kind of a bit of a nut. You're really valorizing things that you've never seen. I mean, you see this, for example, in, in writers who um, valorize uh, war or, you know, talk about its important metaphysical function or moral function. And it's not that they're wrong and that there isn't a point to it. There is. Um, I find it much more palatable when I read it and say the Scottish philosopher Adam Ferguson because he was a soldier, right? And he knew it. Um, when you read it from someone who's never been at the receiving end of a long barreled rifle, yeah, that really tests your charity. Like it's great that people are out there fighting for this ideal, but I'm not and my kids aren't. And then you're like, well, hmm. <laughs> I mean, there's still something to it. I mean, you do have to do the discipline of trying to be appreciative and understanding. But yeah, that that things like that are a bit of a challenge. That's good. Mm, you said in one of the um, recent Darren and, and Mike Unplugged um, videos, which is absolutely amazing, I love it, um, where um, you said something along the lines of, there's been a dark thought that's characterized um, each of the centuries. Um, uh, I was wondering, um, what do you think the um, dark thought um, that characterizes our century is? And what I was wondering what, 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 what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, uh, 21st century, it's hard to say. I don't, think, I, I don't think we've had enough of it yet. You know, you mm. need to get more perspective to be able to see it. Um, so it, it, it's hard to say right now. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd probably take a hard pass on that. I mean, it's tough enough to see what it is for the 20th century. Um, my guess is there, I'm leaning towards Heidegger. Mm. That he's he's really, in some ways, at least for continental European philosophy, maybe the most critical figure. Um, and everyone has to come to terms with him. Um, and no one should particularly like what he has to say, but it's really important. Mm -hmm. What well, could you just go into some some depth into it, what that thought was that Heidegger has that was so dark and so grateful? Well, I mean, Heidegger is in in many ways he's he's uh, reflecting on issues raised in the previous century of of German philosophy, um, what he calls being thrown the experience of historicity, um, and I mean that's been an, an issue at least since Hegel, if not from since Herder and Fichte and Novalis. Um, so, I mean, that's an important issue. His, his answer to that, which is very existential, which is to feel authentic, 
and learn to sort of be yourself and and transgress because the world is given is unpalatable um that has <laughs> you know it's a very interesting philosophical practice uh, idea and then when you ask what would it look like in practice looks like what he did he put on a swastika mm. yeah and he never felt bad about it never apologized uh we have a question should we jump to questions and answers yes i think it's abhishek yeah hello can you hear me i can abhishek how are you i'm doing really good thank you um really amazing answer uh for the question regarding how do you represent an argument uh, um with with any kind of authenticity so that it can actually be discussed in a legitimate way um my question is uh, related to that or follows up on that is that how do you get people to do it because most often people are uh, people are tackling these uh, uh, these issues on a daily basis almost uh, for uh, i come from the country of india several times over people's uh, um, people in the right in the so called right wing of india i don't think there's a left right clear division in india however but the but the the equation the, e the equal the equivalent right wing let's say of india believes in hindu nationalism and one of the things that they that they do is they are twisting history and they are putting blame on like they are looking at the entire history of india as one major arc which it isn't and then they are saying this is why this has happened and that's why we need to take back our country and that is that is enabling so much hate and strife and uh, crime in india currently and how do you get people to uh, be a people who are living a day to day life who aren't uh, you know uh, archaeologist of ancient thought but uh, are trained to do, trained to be so how do you get them to take a closer look and pay attention um that's a really good question and it's a real challenge so um part of the challenge is let's let's do something iliada did which i think is is fruitful let's separate those people into two groups on the one hand are um educated intellectuals who engage with these issues presumably at a sophisticated level and with them you can simply challenge some of the historical account and um point out the places where it doesn't work and what other potential uh competing interpretations and narratives there are um but one of the things i found that uh, in iliad that was so useful as he said that for the vast majority of people they don't actually much engage with these ideas and if they do it's in a very you know propagandistic sloganeering way and so it, it, again depending on on the case in this case i think you're talking about the uh the pursuit of of hindu sattva um and and uh you know sort of militant hinduism yeah. Exactly, by the RSS and the BJP. Right, by RSP and and, and Modi, of course. Um, so again, I, I, were it me, I would first get into it internally. Say, okay, how do they understand the world? What is their vision of history and of um, the role of Hinduism in particular, and their understanding of the history of Hinduism in forming uh, Indian identity and Indian mission. And once you've done that, then you can turn to your audience and say, "Look, these are the reasons that you're attracted to it, and it's understandable. There is something to it. There's something to everything. But is it really even adequate to its own tradition? Which is to say, is the teaching of uh, militant um, Hinduism actually?" Um, does it actually fit with what we read in um in mahabharata or in uh, ramayana or or even specifically in the gita and you know and that's the issue because the bhagavad gita actually was was said just at the start of a war uh, to justify yes. it. so yeah that's right but but when it does it and this is uh, this is wonderful because we're coming back to mercilli iliad he was very interested in that he said what's interesting is um what what krishna is teaching right is uh you need to fight this war uh, but don't think that you're fighting your decision 
will make any difference. The war has already been fought cosmically. The results have already happened cosmically. All you need to do here is do your duty. And the way to avoid having karmic attachment to the sins you will perform, because you will kill your relatives in this battle, right? And those, those are his cousins, that's Drona, that's Bhishma, all the people he could, he loves, he is going, uh, Arjuna is going to kill. How do you do that? Well, you do it through practicing, not militants, right? But, um, but, the, but the yogas, right? The yoga of wisdom, the yoga of, of action, and the bhakti yoga. And once you start raising that whole issue of the high, 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 high bhakti yoga, that sense of acting without attachment to the fruits of your action, boy, you've taken most of the wind. You may still have a, a Hindu party, but how could you possibly have hate and anger when you realize everyone who prays to anything is praying to Krishna? He accepts all their prayers, whether they're Hindus or Taoists or Sikhs or Muslims or Jews or Christians. That's in the text. So you can find in uh, a reading of, Ma of Mahabharata and of, um, uh, of Gita, which justifies war and conflict. Absolutely, that's the center of the story. But it's transfigured into a spiritual event and one that you fight in your heart as much as on the battlefield, right? Because the field of the elephant is also the field of Dharma at the same time. And so, you know, the answer would be, look, if you really want to be militant in your Hinduism, you don't do it in the ballot box. You do it in your soul. You do it in your mind. And um, I think that actually for um, non-intellectuals will probably have a lot more purchase which is to say, forget the big historical cycles. In your own life, you have struggles. When you do it in a pious way, do you hate the person you're struggling against? Or do you just realize, I have no choice, this is my duty, but there but for the grace of God go I. And um, that's why in a really weird way, I mean, I'm again, I'm coming back to Ilya, he would say part of the problem you're having in India is that, both parties, Congress and, um, and yeah, yeah have, uh, have lost the core spirit of subcontinental spirituality, which is not linear. It's, yeah. it's an embrace of cyclical time. And the whole one of the virtues of cyclical time is that it de-accentuates uh, the ego acting in time and acting in history. And it de-accentuates the importance of historical events in such a way as to allow people to be more humane and accepting of, of, of the world around them. So in, in a weird way, you, one is, is tempted to say to, to both Mr. Modi and um, uh, um, uh, the Gandhi family, neither of you seem to understand your culture. You, you, you've all gone Western and the Western here is not the good part of the Western. It's the crazy part. It's the part that looks for redemption in time as opposed to with it internally. Now, thank you for that answer. That's quite uh, wonderful. And yeah, I, I would love to know more about the sources you, you said about uh, Mercia, Iliad, and uh, where I could learn more about it, because this is, this is so interesting. Okay. Well, there is a very short little book, I'm going to hold it up. It's called The Myth of the Eternal Return, or Cosmos in History. And I think he started working on it after the Second World War, but he published it in 1957, um, and published it again later in the 60s. I think it's uh, University of Princeton Press or Princeton University Press. Um, and, you know, it, it's a very polemical piece because he'd also written a wonderful multi-volume history of religious ideas, which just, you know, soup to nuts gives you all the details because he spends his life working on it. Um, but in this one, he makes a case. And I, I think Iliad actually was very taken with subcontinental philosophy, um, like uh, Mueller and others. Mm -hmm. And I, I think he thought that you know, uh, um, modern Western man 
or Western society has become obsessed with historicism and it has driven it kind of insane. And it has led to, you know, real tragedies in history um, and uh, that the burden we're putting on people to live with this burden of history is terrifying and it's not sustainable. So it's it's a very interesting book. I mean, uh, um, one of the things he, he, he points out and what makes, you know, a good sympathetic or charitable reading of things, uh, which he does, shows you that there are a lot more things out there than you think. In other words, you come in, you've got a thesis and it's like you've got a hammer. Everything's a nail and anything that isn't a nail isn't even there. If you open up your toolkit and look at all that's around you, you'll see that not everything is a nail and not everything can be hammered. So one of the things he looks at, I don't know how much you guys um, examine this or if you ever read Iliad or any, it, but if, you, if you're if you interested in, in subcontinental thought, you're certainly aware of it, is the idea of a cyclical time, right? That time is not linear, that it's the same patterns repeating over and over again, which is a position that, the educated among us uh, in the West um, seem to have rejected um, with the coming of historicism. You know, some ways he argues beginning of the 17th century, but clearly Hegel and Marx and Salt and all of these figures and Heidegger are um, there is uh, adopting the historicist view. But Ily Iliad points out nicely is first of all, that's a very recent development. It's a very recent development in a very small part of the world. And it's a very recent development in a very small part of the world. Though it will expand, obviously. It's now China, and as you point out, India now too, is even joining this, this wonderful game. Um, that's actually held only by a very small percentage of the population. That most people still live in many ways in the reassuring world of cyclical time. Um, and precisely because we're eggheads, as it were, uh, and are focused on high cultural ideas, um, we can't see it because we lack the charity to see practices around us every day. But I can tell you some, and you scratch your head at first and say, oh my God, that's right. Every year we celebrate the new year. It's a time of renewal. We've been doing that at least since the founding of Sumer. Why? Because during the course of the year, you went through a lot of unpleasant things and you're carrying a lot of burdens from that year. Relationships that didn't work out, papers that didn't work out, uh, fights you had with friends, wars, plagues, famines, etc. And it's just, it's a heavy burden to, to bear. And so the idea of the new year is you put that to bed, you make resolutions for the new year and you start fresh. You know those things aren't gone, but you sort of put them in the back of your head. That's just one example. I mean, almost all of the um, religious rituals of all the major faiths uh, follow a liturgical calendar of birth and rebirth. But um, I'm on this side of the pond, we, we tend to follow um, a very bizarre game called American football where people basically play rugby in spacemen outfits. And hit each other. <laughs> it's basically what they do, right? With a lot of commercials. Um, and people are intensely invested in their teams. You know, they're Cowboy fans, they're 49er fans, they're whatever. Um, most of those teams are going to lose. And the end of the year is, well, you go home and pack your stuff up because you guys are a bunch of losers. But then the season ends there's a fresh draft, it's spring, it's renewal, hope regrows, next year, next year we will win, we'll finally beat the Cowboys or whoever it is that's your rival. And uh, that's a really real phenomena among fans. Are they playing and fantasizing? Well, yeah, kind of, but so are those who believe in linear time. It's all, you know, a certain amount of imaginary, um, enactment. Uh, that's, you know, to, to, to mention another 
really interesting writer. I don't know if you guys have ever heard a story by the name of John Ruzinga. No. Okay. He was about 40 years ago, he was a really big deal. Um, he wrote a very influential book called The Waning of the Middle Ages, about the high Middle Ages. But after that, he wrote a really fun book. You guys should check it out, called Homo Ludens, Man the Player. And it's, it's a very interesting piece of historical sociology. And he, what he says basically is, you know, people sustain themselves through playing. And they played all the time. Uh, 150 holy days in the, in the uh, medieval uh, liturgical calendar. It's 150 days of partying. And on those days, you played soccer. That's where soccer came from. You played it against the, the, the next village. Um, and you did reenactments. You did rogation time. You walked around your, your parish and the, the priest blessed it. You had uh, church ales. You danced. You renewed the year. Um, was this literally real? No. Did everyone know it was kind of make-believe? Yeah. Did they suspend disbelief? Yeah. That was... And, and he goes, it, once he set that up, he goes further and he says, and you know what? You don't ever stop playing. Man plays, he imagines, and lives in that imagination. So, yeah. <laughs> um, quick example. We, we believe in, in the United States that we live in, in a democracy, right? And that we're, we're committed to democracy. And it's a beautiful belief. And I don't want to suggest that it's entirely nonsense. Of course, it's not. But does anyone think they're going to actually get nominated to anything without corporate backing? Does anyone think that they're going to be even in the running for president without a billion dollars behind them? Does anyone think that if I went out and ran for president and made a statement tomorrow, no matter how brilliant it is, that a single newspaper, it's out, except for maybe my local town rag that needs to fill some pages, is going to report on it? So does that mean that we don't have a democracy? No, it means we have popular elected government. Um, <laughs> but it means that we play. And it's a better game to play that than to play the dictator game. I mean, you see where other places where they play the dictator game, that's really ugly. But th that's that kind of, uh, of, of insight there, which is we are actually having choices about the orientation we take. And that's one of the liberations of thinking cyclically is that it allows us to put away uh, some of the burdens of, of the past and history. Even in linear things like elections, they often have a periodistic character. I know in Britain, if your government doesn't collapse, you will have an election after five years, right? Why? I don't know, but you do, right? Be why? I do know why. If you think about it, you can just come up with a thousand proce procedural reasons None of them are, are, are relevant. When Poland changes, the government will collapse anyway of its own weight. You need to be renewed. Every time there's a, a, a new election, it's like Great Britain, the United Kingdom is born afresh. It has a new, fresh start. It's, it's the beginning of spring. It's, and, and you give that glorious sort of springy feeling and celebration of that first visit to 10 Downing Street. Similarly, when um, when um, uh, His Grace is crowned, which is coming up, that will be a new age, a new birth, right? And it'll be surrounded with all of that symbolism. Now, as college-educated people, we can poo-poo that. Um, and Iliad says, well, you do poo-poo it. But for regular folk, they don't. That's important. and. Um, one might argue that that's one of the reasons they might find the burden of history um, less heavy and dealing with different thoughts less fraught uh, than those who take time seriously. Because if you take linearity seriously, things are irreversible. There's no going back and there's no atoning. And so that puts a very heavy burden on you. If if you're about to vote in an election, I don't care which party you're voting for, but if you take, if, if the, the horizon of meaning that is real is the here and now, the, the throneness, the ontic, 
um, uh, of which Heidegger speaks, your responsibility on that election is cosmic. And the odds of your getting it wrong are very high. And you have to wear, bear that burden till the day you die. That's not easy, right? And that makes it very difficult to make any decisions also. If you think about it periodistically, well, I'm gonna vote for you know, social Democrats this time. And if it, if it goes to crapper, well, there'll be another time. <laughs> I'll try someone else. Um, boy, it's much easier. And it's also, once you've made that commitment, I am going social democratic, right? That's, that's me. I, I think that's your third party, right? Uh, liberal Democrats, I think so, yeah. Oh. Liberal Democrats. Liberal Democrats, sorry. <laughs> liberal Democrat. If you think, I'm going liberal Democrat, um, and that's, that's the answer for us. That's, that's what history demands. What do you make of people who don't? Of people who wind up going labor or Tory? Either they're blind and stupid, and if they're not, they're wicked, and they stand in the way of redemption. Boy, that's not a pleasant thought to have between your ears. That's not a pleasant way to live, right? Because that may be your, your cousin, your brother, your girlfriend. So that's, you know... I, I mean, and, you know, this is all a sort of side a, a comment from the issues that <clears throat> Abhishek raised, but that's one of the um, reasons why he, he would say for all of the centrality of our historicisms today, probably most people on the planet are immune to it. They don't live in that world. For them, yes, there are linear things. There are wars. Those are important. There are plagues and famines and contagions, and all of these are important. But what they put at the center of their understanding of, of their temporal existence is the circular, the cyclical things. Well, uh, my cousin just got married. Two years later, my cousin just had a child. There's going to be a naming ceremony. And my grandfather just passed. And there's going to be funerary rites for that. And et cetera, et cetera. You know, these, these patterns of, because the cycle doesn't have to just be calendrical. There's the life cycle too, of birth, of youth, of maturity, of, of old age, and then of course of death. Um, if those are seen as just a one-dimensional, finite temporal thing, then you're left with Camus and Sartre's terror. You must face the reality of, of death. That you were born and you will die, and everything you achieve will be forgotten. But if you look at, you know, in terms of the traditional patterns, then it's like, well, of course you go through these things. So did your grandfather, so did your great grandfather, so did your great great grandmother, and someone will after you too. And uh, precisely because it's preordained and necessary and essential, it doesn't carry quite the sting. It's not as important. So, I mean, one example of this, and um, again, to go back to the subcontinent, is the idea of the Mahayuga, the great age, uh, and with it, the idea of eternal return, which is that things don't just head in one direction, that everything that happens has already happened, and it will happen again. So this is consoling, if you haven't read it. The, so the Mahayuga argues for um, a great age, and many great ages make up one day in the life of, of the deity, but a great age uh, in includes four distinct sub-ages. And by the way, this is not unique to uh, the subcontinent. You find this in all um, of the uh, pre-Levant uh, religious traditions. Um, there is a, an age of, of gold, an age of silver, um, an age of bronze, and then or, or, or iron sometimes. Um, and then in the Hindu conception, it's called the age of Kali, and that's the age of darkness. So in each of these ages, people live less, uh, shorter lives. Uh, you get this also in the Old Testament that, you know, each generation lives shorter than the one before because time wears things down. So the, the, the world's less fertile, becomes less fertile. People live shorter lives. The gods become more distant. 
and um, uh, and and social and personal relations become um, harsher. So at the very last phase, the the phase of Kali, um, people don't live more than you know eighty to hundred years, and um, nature uh, only yields when it is carefully cultivated, and uh, people have replaced. Uh, uh, the centrality of agriculture and cattle t tending and warfare with business and commerce and shaking money. So this is, Iliad argues, and, 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 and I think he's right, this is a deeply consoling um, doctrine because obviously, what time do you live in of those ages? We are in the Kali Yuga. <laughs> Always. Everyone is, right. Every, everyone who's lived in what we would call history, not in, in mythic time, but in history, it's always been the Kali Yuga. That's reassuring because, okay, things aren't good. It's not your fault. Things aren't good because it's a machine and it's time for it not to be good. And when it's done not being really, eventually we'll start electing, you know, senile old people to office and then the universe will collapse. And it'll start all over again, perfect gold, and it'll be renewed. So that's a very, you know, that kind of an idea of, uh, of cyclical destiny that, you know, your country is eventually going to get old. Um, <laughs> uh, doesn't have to be um, a, a source of existential dread. Um, it can instead be a sort of, you know, worldly acceptance. Well, it's the life pattern, you know. I'm Dutch. Once upon a time, we control the world. We don't now. We were young then, we're older now, but we have a nice old age. You know, we, we still have uh, good coffee bars and, and uh, restuffle. So, you know, it ain't, ain't so bad. You know, sometimes you get old. We're old now. It's our turn. It's our turn to be old. We, we, we tend our dikes. We, we build our seawalls. We live nicely. We're no longer making big history. Okay. That, that's the life cycle. Every country has to go through it at some point. Or at least that's that's one conception. And that was a very common conception. I mentioned that conception because although um, post-Hegelian man is supposed to reject that, I suspect most common folks still believe it and buy it more than the idea of linearity. You know, that, oh... You, you hear this uh, on, on my side of the pond, you hear this all the time when people grouse, uh, oh, we're going down the road like Rome. Well, you're grousing like Rome, but what are you really saying? You're really reassuring yourself. This is ineluctable. The Romans knew that it wasn't going to be permanent. Nothing is permanent. We're not either. So if it wasn't for that, you would feel horrible. Look at what our, what our parents and grandparents did to build up this country to make it the bulwark of whatever you think it's the bulwark of. And what have we done? We got on FaceTime. That was our great contribution to the world, was uh, social media. Right? That, that, boy, that's a heavy burden to bear. Isn't it easier to just say, well, look, but these, these things happen. You know, um, trying to think of the lines, a great line in, uh, in a song called Oh England by uh, PJ Harvey. Um, <laughs> where she's singing about how much she loves England, it's, it's pining for the, you know, the, the, the results of the First World War. And she says, um, the people, they stagnate, stagnate with time, like air, like water. She still loves England, but, you know, I mean, Bojo, there you go. <laughs> you know, it's going to happen. So, you know, I, I don't know that that's, true that's a, that's a question of perspective um but i i think the question that iliad's asking and i think a, a question that comes into bear when we look at talking about some of the more controversial issues today is um to what extent are these experiences of crises and i don't mean just political i mean psychological and characterological, because people are suffering. Uh, are they a function of uh, engaging in historical time without any consolation? 
So yeah, let me give you a, a point of contrast. So Eliade says that, that he believes that the beginning of this notion of historical time actually um, begins with the uh, messianic prophets of, of the Old Testament and then Christianity and Islam, obviously. And uh, they face history, the events, not as cyclically repatting, repeating patterns, but of themselves meaningful as theophanies, as revelations of the wrath or love of the supreme being. And he says what makes that bearable is that all of those views ultimately will do away with time. That you'll bear the pain now, but there will eventually be an intercession where um, things will be put right, where the guilty will be punished, the innocent will be rewarded, the virtuous will be uplifted, suffering will be eliminated, and the world will be made um, perfect. And that faith that that, that will happen allows one to endure um, the misgivings that or the, the misfortunes that come to a country, but also to an individual in the course of a year or a life or whatever, with a lot more equanimity, because there is the belief that it's going to work out in the rain, in, in the end, I should say. And um, with that comes a, a willingness to forbear uh, a lot of anger and anxiety and frustration and hate. He says what changed is when you get a, quote, secular historicism to the extent that we actually do have one, then it really, then you start getting the, the you know, the Sartres, people who are just like, well, you know, since you've been born, it's too late to kill yourself. And Kennedy says, no, it's not. It's really not. Um, <laughs> assuming it is, you just have to live in, 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 you know, miserable unhappiness and dread because you're thrown into this world and you have no control over it and it's, it's not good. And so he says, ultimately, without faith, um, the historicism, living in time and finding redemption in historical time, which is to say, ultimately, politics um, is unsustainable, that it produces uh, incredible psychological and emotional um, disfiguration uh, and pain. And um, I, more and more, I, I, I don't know. What do you guys see? I, I'm seeing a lot of pain out there. Yeah, especially since COVID. Um, we, we recently spoke with um, uh, John Viveki, who's a cognitive scientist at um, Un University of Toronto. He, he spoke to us about um, his idea of the, the meaning crisis. Um, yeah. and just on, on, on some uh, so many amazing and, and, and interesting things that you've you've just brought up, I think just as musicians, um, I, I'd love to ask about this idea of Homo Lutens, because um, with with um, John Viveki, we were talking about um, so in, in order to solve um, the, the the meaning crisis that he talks about, he emphasizes the role of uh, serious play, um, yeah. obviously. As musicians, that's what we're involved in. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to um, play uh, music uh, with each other very seriously and, and try and engage in, in the spirit of that um, discourse. And um, uh, I guess where, where my, my question is going is, is, uh, is this potentially, uh, in, uh, well, one, of my, one of my favorite quotes of Eliad is, 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 is um, the terror of history is when a man is no longer religious and he has to sort of grasp at the crimes of history without understanding the meaning of them. Um, uh, just sort of tagging on to that, this is a long question. Um, <laughs> Nietzsche uh, sort of says that um, his, his suggestion for the replacement of religion by, um, by art um, can help sort of alleviate this um, the, the, the meaninglessness. Um, yes. I don't um, yeah. But essentially what, what, what I'm asking is, is, is uh, this idea of serious play a way to alleviate the terror of history? Absolutely. Uh, in part because it, it's, it's, I, I love that phrase, by the way, serious play, because it's both, you, you have to take it seriously. You have to be emotionally invested in it. And yet you know it's play, right? You know it's artifice. It's the same thing with 
uh, you know, uh, the, the that idea you mentioned of, you know, replace um, faith with, with, with art. And that was the rise of the aesthetic movement and art for art's sake, the Paul Valeri's and, and, uh, um, uh, um, James Joyce's and, and T.S. Eliot. Absolutely. Uh, but even there, um, what you see is a, a subtle reintroduction of cyclicalism. So if you're, you're, you engage in serious play musically, um, presumably you are using the same time signatures. You're accepting shared conventions of what is, what's the, uh, what key are we playing in? Um, even if you're doing free form jazz, there are distinct structures that you're accepting. And yet those structures are not determined by the universe and authorized by being, there's an arbitrary element. You agreed to them. They were conventions. You know, we'll do three, four time and whatever, and we'll play in the, the, the key of whatever. Um, and the same thing with, uh, you know, any kind of art, whether it, it it's painting. Well, look, if you're going to look at that painting and you're going to paint a painting, um, you're accepting certain conventions. I'm going to use, you know, known colors on a on a uh, uh, on a canvas. I am again, depending on the the moment and the movement. It may be I'm interested in recapturing the experience of light. Perhaps I'm interested in rendering uh, objects with verisimilitude. Perhaps I want to tell stories, and you develop all kinds of um, structures and canons around them which give you the architecture within which you can play freely. But if you play freely without any constraint, that's just conflict. So I, I do think free play be, uh, can help us uh, find meaning, but remember what happens is the meaning stops being like cosmic and starts to shrink down to a human scale. So how can we produce something that is tonally interesting and compelling within these time signatures and in this key, within, within a certain mood. We want to achieve a certain mood. And within those constraints, there's tons of room for play. How can I tell a story in um, using new techniques of, let's say, stream of consciousness that nonetheless develops a character and brings a plot into um, fruition? Does that make sense? Yeah. Brilliant. Um, I think Abhishek's got another question. Yeah. Um, no, not a question, but rather a certain. Um, uh, uh, I, I've, you said something in term, in the long lines of arbitrariness of rules whenever it comes to something like uh, uh, painting or music. However, uh, the one of the most essential things that one realizes when someone's composing or someone's you know, uh, performing a piece is that a piece of music works for, for reasons that aren't really arbitrary as well, because uh, right. the and the painting, a composition of a painting, for example, isn't arbitrary as well. Colors work in a very particular rules in a set of ways that um, uh, we, there is a certain degree of choice and arbitrariness within these rules, but there are, there are fits in, uh, fits of things like a performance of a Bach sonata either works or it doesn't. <laughs> there isn't, uh, and, and isn't that in a why music uh, music can replace art is that it's not an arbitrary thing it, there are certain rules outside of your control that uh, that either makes it work or not and because of that that's something beyond yourself and therefore there's something somewhat something to aspire to in that sense I, I think i think that's exactly right when i said arbitrary i didn't mean that no rules i mean that those conventions the rules vary from genre to genre from period to period but without those constraints, without some sort of structure, um, it becomes not a composition, but a chaos. And uh, even the attempt to um, reproduce some sense of, of chaos on the canvas or in music uh, fails, I think, if it isn't constrained by some, um, uh, by some order. I mean, give you an example. Um, one of the most chaotic painters uh, um, in, in, in American history was Jackson Pollock. 
Um, and it looks wild, but it, and he certainly broke all the rules, right? I mean, he was not doing figurative work. He wasn't representing anything. He wasn't even using brushes. He was just using cans of paint with a stick and just, but within that, if you look at them carefully, they do follow compositional rules. They're not random patterns and it's not a random throw of colors. You can see he has first, he learned how to control the drip very carefully. If you've ever tried painting your walls, you know it's not so easy to control that. You may make a real mess on the floor. He he wasted a lot of canvases learning how to control that. And then once he did and figured out this canvas will have many curves, that canvas will have more straight lines. Will the reds be on the top or on the bottom? And and the whites and the other colors. So absolutely, I, 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 Abhishek, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's true also of musical forms. Um, it's true of painting forms. It's true of, of, of any artistic form. There has to be structure. The structure, there's not one structure. It doesn't have to be only one structure, but there must be a structure within which you can work. Uh, otherwise, it's impossible to play. In its simplest sense, think back to when you were little kids and you played games with your younger brother or your older sister or whatever. Um, whatever you played, you did have to come up with rules because there would be a point where like you were playing, I don't know, cops and robbers and, uh, you know, you're the robber and you you run away from from the policeman and, and, and the guy playing the cop says, well, I say, bang, you're dead. And you say, no, come on. You knew you had to have your finger pointed at me and you had to be close enough to do the phone. I'm not playing if you're going to do that, right? You got to play by the rules. And that's true of, of all play. So, and I, I bring this back to the, the cyclical because when you play, it's measured in time. There's a beginning, a middle, and end. And you can repeat it. If you have the notation, you can do it over and over again. Sometimes better, sometimes worse sometimes just different. And every time it's fresh and new. That's a wonderful contrast to that linearity. You know, this was a bad concert, you're a failure, <laughs> right? Don't ever bother trying again. You, 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 you didn't dance that step correctly. You know, you have to bear that forever. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to say, yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll try it again next night. <laughs> Maybe I'll get it better. And I don't have to carry that burden forever. I know about it and I've learned from it. And then I'm told the story of, well, you know, every dancer as they come along first makes mistakes, then masters their field, and then becomes a choreographer. And then within that cycle, um, you find meaning for your striving and working. So I'm not sure that, again, I'm not trying to say that taking it in a more linear way um, can't work, but it's, I'll give you, try, try an example with you. Let's say that we decide that we're going to take the Andy Warhol view. Art is whatever you can get away with. Um, and we're looking at a series of paintings exemplifying epics from there's Giotto, there's Veronese, there's Raphael. Now I've got some Caravaggio, I've got some Rubens, I've got a Vermeer, I'm following up with uh, Chardin, and then David, and then Corbet. And then I wind up with like Banksy, right? Now, <clears throat> if I take that in a cyclical way, I say, look, you can see the ideas are changing, the forms are changing, each movement, whether it's expressionism or or Baroque or Rococo goes through its phases, it runs its phases, it ends, and then something else comes along. If on the other hand, you say, no, it's telling a story and it's going forward and, and it ends with Banksy. I don't know, I enjoy Banksy, but I'm thinking like, okay, my great grandfather, they did Van Gogh, I did Banksy. God, I don't want to carry that around with me, right? A civilization that produced Gauguin, right? That produced Matisse, that produced Paul Clay, Banksy. 
Whereas, you know, if it's, oh, no, 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 these things happen all the time. There was a time when people liked uh, Norman Rockwell. Okay, well, now, Banksy doesn't hurt so much. It's like, I, in fact, enjoy Banksy. You know, it's nice and light, but if if this is the end, that you know, we're going to paint rats on the wall and make fun of rich toffs being a rich toff. <laughs> it's not, you know, for me, <laughs> again, every, everyone pick your own examples, but for me, that's an example of where, like, Oh, I'd like to be able to say that the art's reflecting a moment and moments past. You know, mm -hmm. something will come after this that'll but it won't be Louise Bourgeois, let's hope. Tony? Yeah, um, I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about what you were just saying, Darren, there about sort of what what the the next cycles of the art world and the music world could be, because from my point of view, um, there is this sort of, in contemporary art and contemporary music, there's this sort of flattening where yeah. we understand so well that any rule can be broken and or could be applied in any sort of situation that we're very sort of tentative about wanting to fix any boundaries on anything, which yeah. in a way is it's very good, but that seems to me kind of different than any movement that's come before. And I, I wonder whether we can ever sort of settle down again into into something simple after this. Well, I, I think it I think it's a philosophically interesting position that you know we are rooted in in, in moment and need to you know um, see the transgression of rule, and that's largely what's I you know again you guys are more tapped into the music um, scene than me, but um, looking at visual arts uh and not popular arts i mean high arts um it i, I think what, what's been going on for like 50 60 years is the i uh, i realization that one can't transgress against the canons and uh received um techniques and ideals uh, of the past and treat them ironically and that is a very intellectually compelling and exciting um, ideal, and, and I think you get some very philosophically profound artwork. I, uh, um, the late Arthur Danto made just such a claim about uh, Andy Warhol's work. Having said that, you can also ask, okay, that's philosophically and theoretically interesting. Is it nice to listen to? Is it nice to look at? And um, if you're asking me about where the hope of cycles of renewal are, it will be when the government gets so bankrupt that it can't anymore fund experimental, weird, transgressive stuff that artists will have to re rediscover markets. And that will put discipline on them. <laughs> when you have to make... Well, but we, we forget there was a time when people really liked classical music when people really enjoyed going to concerts. Uh, in part because they didn't have many other choices, um, but in part because the music was much more accessible in that it didn't transgress as much, right? The joy of transgression comes after you've mastered the rules, after you can do it by the rules, then you want to free yourself and liberate yourself. But if you can't even do it by the rules, hearing that liberation, is just painful and and so unless you can you know in a work show the the uh, audience this is the rule this is its transgression you understand how it's being transgressed and transformed and now let's see what that means and how to participate unless you can do that it just sounds like noise in the same way that unless you know uh, a museum goer knows the history of abstract painting they look at Andy Warhol and say, but my kid could do this. Well, your kid can't do it, first of all. It's just not true. It's not that easy. But that is a very common reaction. This is just ugly. Well, of course it's ugly. It's very difficult to, it's a very difficultly acquired taste, right? I mean, we're all older now. We like asparagus. You didn't like asparagus as a kid. It's not a naturally likable thing. Sodi pop is likable. Cookies are likable. You have to cultivate your, 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 your palate. Um, and to, to bring this back full circle, 
cultivating your palate is in fact a kind of play. And it's mm. a deep play. And it's deeply satisfying and fun. And part of it is, look, I learned this new trick. I can do this. Part of it also is, hey, all the toffs, they can do this. And me, I'm a plebe. I can do it now, too. It's profoundly <laughs> satisfying. No, and it's profoundly satisfying to say, look, this isn't just theirs anymore. It's mine. I've got it, too. I understand what Miles Davis is doing. I really do. I've read enough about it. I don't have to go to college to get that. Wow. You know, um, some artists, I, I don't know, have any of you ever read the, uh, the novel Portrait of an Artist by, uh, Portrait of the Artist by, uh, uh, as a Young Man by uh, James Joyce? Trying to read it. <laughs> Trying to okay, read you it. had to. So <laughs> it, as he's writing this book, he's developing new techniques, a couple new techniques, uh, one of which is, we mentioned the stream of consciousness, but the other is unattributed dialogue where he just puts in M dashes and then words. And you have to figure out who's speaking. You have to learn to hear. He doesn't do it all at once. He'll start the dialogue and attribute two people or three people and then drop the names in the quotation marks. So what's he done? He's trained you to hear. You're using the same convention that you use with Dickens or Trollope with the quotes. And then he says, okay, now I'm going to take the training wheels off. You can do this. I'm learning to do it as Stephen. I'm pretending to be Stephen to learn to do it. And you as the audience will do it. And now I'm going to do the same thing with stream of consciousness and with writing various uh, forms of poetry. So you can train your audience up uh, in the arts uh, to appreciate new technique. But only if you keep in mind, only if you have an audience that um, is a mass audience. If it's a high cultured audience, then the snob appeal goes way higher and you don't want to teach it because the satisfaction would be, I like Arthur Schoenberg. You don't like Arthur Schoenberg. I don't want you to like Arthur Schoenberg because it makes me better than you. But I can listen to 12-tone music and, and find satisfaction to it. I can listen to Charles Ives and I get it. And you don't and you shouldn't, you shouldn't be reading The Guardian, you know, and um, I could be wrong, but I think that's an e an aesthetic ethos we have developed that is uh, uh, based on this linear linearity, this idea that, well, we're ahead of others. Boy, it's a very unpleasant way. Uh, it's really much joy in art then. I don't think even, so. Even if it's uh, not to our, uh, I, I, it is very well developed to our own tragedy because uh, we end up playing the same music to the same set of people who are doing the same thing to us, or same same way in art school, and we never get to learn what people outside of the outside of it uh, think. So we are just listening to feedback and criticism and feeling like, oh, we aren't there yet, or we aren't good enough, or we are not supposed to do this. And then when you play for your family who never who don't care about all of that, they are like, oh, this sounded nice, and that's all. <laughs> And then you see normal people for the first time. And so stepping out of it is also very beneficial for the artist as well, as much as it is for the public in a way. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it, in the arts, in everywhere in our high culture, we've had two things. One, well, everything is two sides. So the wonderful thing is we've exposed a lot more people to high culture and to college education and to that higher training, which is terrific. Um it's it's ideal in fact but the flip side of that is that has increasingly become the marker of of social status and has led to a new kind of elitism a a high cultural elitism you know and look i'm i'm not going to say i'm better than anyone else we all have it it's a certain pride uh in our um you know ability to ingest uh, um, difficult high cultural things, you know, and everybody can appreciate F. Scott Fitzgerald, but how many people can really appreciate T.S. Eliot? Well, there you go. Um, and same in, 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 in painting or, or, or mute. everyone likes Matisse, but boy, how many people can really appreciate Chaim Soutine? Not too many. It looks a lot like Francis Bacon, except that he knows that actually paint. Um, so it's, you know, uh, that's the, that's the flip side of having hung so much 
on uh, on the high culture is that we have a tendency to lose touch between the high culture and what I would call the, the sort of mass culture or common culture. And that's very unhealthy. Um, not just for the common culture because it loses the, the uh, possibility of being enriched by the high, but also for the high culture, it very quickly becomes or can become uh, rather closed and sterile. At least that's my sense. And I think that's, that's kind of happened when, when we talk among ourselves and no one else can understand what we're talking about. Uh, you know, if there's some technical advantage to that, and sometimes there is, you get that in technical fields and the sciences and, you know, in, in uh, uh, composition and music and in art too, and in history, some of that is necessary. Uh, but when we retreat into that entirely, when, you know, we, we've got our 12-tone scale down, we can't really appreciate a simple rag by Scott Joplin. I don't know. I think that's getting to be a little bit sterile. But, but again, that may just be my taste. Yeah, th thanks, Dan. Um, just to, to follow up on that then, because we're already drifting back into this conversation about cyclical time and linear time again. And mm. um, I understand both you and Dr. Sugru, your real training is as historians rather than philosophers. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing you, you must feel in a way a tension between those two things, because as an academic historian, you would always be have to teach things in a linear way, right? There's no room really for a cyclical sort of interpretation of things in that setting. So I'm just wondering how you manage that really. And is, is it a case of just, you have to, like we, like we talked about with, the, with John Verbeke's um, serious play, like you, you have practices in your life that, that honor the cyclical side of things and then you situate the linear things within that. Yeah, though, I think that's, that is basically what you do. However, um, once you are aware of the cyclical, uh, although you are dealing with irreversible events in time, pure historicism, um, you can note that a big part of the historical field was uh, feelings of, of cyclical renewal. Right? I mean, you know, I do early American history. So we're dealing with the... Um, American Revolution, Novo Seclorum, a, a new uh, um, no, Novo Sodor Seclorum, new new order for the ages. Uh, at the same time, that generation who created this new thing fought in cyclical patterns. John Adams famously wrote, uh, "I'm not going to get it exactly right, but I'll get it sort of. I, I must study politics." so my son can study philosophy and rhetoric and his son can study ceramics and painting. And he thought that was the natural progress of a country. And what would come after that? Well, you would become a fet, decadent, and I don't mean to be offensive, but I'm saying this from John Adams' perspective, and you would become the British. <laughs> we'll all be British, right? We'll 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 sip tea and 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 watch our liberty dance away, or at least that's what Adams thought. And not so much, um, but so there was that uh, cyclical pattern. The uh, Jeffersonian democracy was a very real and new and powerful phenomena in the world, had not been seen before, and yet they understood themselves as facing a tragic cycle of history. That eventually, so Jefferson, very briefly, you, no reason for you to know this, you're not, you're not Yanks. Um, our, our first two parties, one of the things that separated them was their vision of what America's future should look like. And uh, the Federalist Party of George Washington and John Adams and Alexander Hamilton thought that the future would be, America would be a commercial republic uh, with industry, manufacturing, commerce, and banking that would be like all of the other great leading urban cultures of, of Europe. 
right? Like Britain and, and the Netherlands and, and, and France. And their opposition, the Jeffersonians, what became the Democratic Party, were agrarians. They wanted America, much more Rousseauian. America should remain a land of frontier farmers, independent household cottagers who, you know, uh, feed their families with subsistence farmers, with a little farming with a little bit of trade, and all are independent, live in small towns, little, you know, Mayberry America. Um, What's interesting is that Jefferson and Madison, while they believed this and wanted this and fought for this and kicked Indians off their land, didn't think it was a good thing, thought it was a horrible thing, but thought it was worth it to keep urbanization and manufacturing at bay. It, whatever we have to do to African-Americans and Amerindians, it's worth it to, to, to keep our agrarian um, um, character. Um, nonetheless, they thought, Eventually, Hamilton's right. That's the future. And so all we can do is, is fight that cycle as long as possible. And eventually, yeah, there will be New York and, and Chicago, and there's nothing you can do about it. But please give us at least a century without New York and Chicago. At least a century. And and hopefully, I mean, you know, if if by by the grace of God, smallpox will decimate Philadelphia. We're saved. <laughs> oh no, boy! Did, did Jefferson celebrate when when plagues hit Philadelphia? He was like, "Oh God, burn these things down, get rid of them." We'll have to have them eventually, but oh my God, they're horrible. Um, that's you know, that's not a, an eternal return cycle, but it is a sense that there is a cycle here. So yeah, that's not something that um, uh, is alien. There was a movement in, in Jacksonian America. I don't know how much you guys know about American history. We, we, we Everyone knows. No reason you should. But um, our first populist president uh, was a guy by the name of Andrew Jackson, who's the uh, the last general to actually beat the British in something. <laughs> the Battle of New Orleans. After the war was over, no one knew. He actually won a battle and became president as a result. Um, the political movement that supported him and his populism and westward expansion was called Young America. And that phrase, uh, which was cribbed from Young Hungary, because it it's around 1848, it's the time of the, the, uh, the, the nationalist movements throughout Europe, is this idea that America is a young country. It's in the early phase of its life cycle, but it will go through the same life cycle of every other country and eventually will become old and feeble and Dutch. Um, and hopefully we'll, it'll decline as nicely and elegantly uh, as, as the Dutch did. And, and you know, I, I mention this because for early Americans, remember the Dutch empire had been a world colossus when the colonies are being settled. And by the time they're breaking with Britain, it's a plaything of the British, right? They, they tell it where to go. Uh, whereas previously Britain and France had teamed up and attacked the Netherlands, and they came and sailed up the Thames and, and burnt your fleet to the ground. So there was a moment when they were puissant, you know, um, but that passed. And uh, one of the guys who led Young America is an artist by the name of Thomas Cole. He's a leading figure of something called the, Hunt, the Hudson Valley um, School of, of Romantic Painting. And if you ever get to the National Gallery in, in uh, Washington, there's a cycle he painted, and it is exactly one of these uh, circular schemes of, you know, uh, the, the cycles of history. Young Rome, um, uh, vital Rome, middle age, aging, and then the collapse and the vandals are coming in and burning everything. And it's, it's the same setting. It's just going through the four different um, phases. So even when you teach... Uh, the irreversibility, ir irreversibility of, of events, um, the people who are doing those events are often thinking of it and enduring it within a, a, a cyclical pattern. So you, you do work it in. And oddly enough, even guys who see, like if we had in the 19th century an historian who really saw conjuncture, one direction in time, break, world historical event, it was Abraham Lincoln. I mean, that was his, 
his understanding of the nightmare he lived through, the, the Civil War, which is by far the bloodiest war America's ever had. I mean, in contemporary casualty terms, if we took as many casualties as we did then, it would have been about eight or nine million dead. So it's it's a bloodbath. Um, and so he sees this as, this is a fundamental change. Slavery's gone. A new age is, is, has come. But when he gives the Get Gettysburg Address, he says, but we, four score and seven years ago, there's a beginning there, a maturation here, a, a step forward there. And there's this sense of rebirth, renewal. We will, we, we, today we renew the promise of 1776. We, we rededicate ourselves. So it's, it's as if we had a glory, and, and this was actually Lincoln's uh, thinking, we had a glorious revolution. Not the glorious revolution, but our own. A really great revolution, which was a new birth of freedom for the world. And struggled against slavery in all its forms. And then things went south. It started to decay. And while America was still largely good, certain bad things started to become, you know, we got old. We got decadent. Now, the Civil War is the next generation. It's a new birth. And uh, we can start fresh again. And that's, um, you know, if you look at the the um, language, not just the United States and in, in the UK too, uh, at the end of the second at the end of the Second World War, it was very much treated that way, as if an age has passed. It was a horrible age, horrible. But a new age is upon us, and it's time to like put the trauma apart and start fresh, start new again, and. Uh, I think without that, it would have been very hard to endure, you know, the trauma of the Second World War. They didn't do that after the First World War. And my God, was it difficult to, to have survived that, right? Where, well, you know, all these people die. They come home horribly maimed. They have shell shock for the rest of their lives. They have uncontrollable shaking. There's nothing you can do about it but put them on morphine. Um, and they're going to be shell shocked for the rest of their lives and or or maimed or psychologically you know pained and what do you what do you tell them you know well you know what was the point of that well things happen history happens developments happen it's unidirectional well i mean what's come out of it we'll find out in the future boy what a <laughs> that's not an easy burden to bear you know as you can imagine poetry coming out of that's pretty bleak <laughs> right the art and the music and the religion coming out of that is bleak so you know we need this occasionally to renew um my sense is ultimately most most people are like uh good meat-headed american um politicians the good the good ones are are meat-headed and this is the, the, the core American philosophy, which I happen to agree with, uh, of pragmatism. And that is when you're, I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy called Yogi Berra. Uh, he, he, was, he was a catcher for the New York Yankees in popular imagination, but he was really America's greatest philosopher. And he would give off these maxims, which were very funny, but they were profound. And one of them is, when you find, when you come across a fork in the road, Take it. <laughs> but that isn't, in fact, um, what we do. So, I mean, we do that politically. We, if you haven't followed American discourse, it's like, what should we have? Uh, should we cut spending or raise taxes? Because we, we can't go on like we are. Should we cut spending? That's one party. And the other one says, raise taxes. Well, the sensible American says, yes. Right? Cut taxes and raise spending. Works for me. <laughs> so that's what we do until you can't, and then we'll figure something else out. But it's always what we do. What will we have? Guns or butter? Yeah. Guns and butter. That sounds good. You do you want, you know, uh um uh war or or love? Oh, war and love sounds good to me. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, well, I, I think it's actually uh a, a healthy culture um does both with 
cyclical and linear time. Some things are linear, uh, and you can't ignore the historicity of, of certain events. Uh, and they're, you know, as you said, you can't teach history without saying this happened and it doesn't go away. It's real. Um, and at the same time, um, acknowledge that some things are, are more fruitfully considered or were more fru fruitfully considered as renewable or as, you know, uh, um, cycles. But think about this. I, I bet when you were kids and you were taught contemporary uh, British history, you got some of that too, right? There was the age of Attlee. You know, the age of social democracy, and then the epoch of Thatcher, the age of Blair. Well, these are, you know, really, the changes were not as dramatic as we think <laughs> they But they're good ways of organizing uh, the feeling, the feeling of Attlee of, this is our moment. We have suffered horribly for the world. We carried the world when, when the Americans were off you know, chasing hot dogs. We were fighting the Battle of Britain. We held off the Soviet Union and the Brit and the Nazis ourselves and the Germans all by ourselves and the Japanese. Now it's our turn. We should get something for this. A National Health Service. Wow. So that's, you can see that that's not just, I mean, it's a big linear event, but it's also a big renewal. We paid this price. We get it. That's a renewal precisely because there'll become another point at which you say, we did that, that was great. And now it's time to do something else. It's run its course and we, it's left us begging the IMF for bailouts. And we were the only third world country in Europe. We need to get, renew the British spirit, whatever that means, renew the British spirit. <laughs> it happened, right? I mean, Gloriana, it wasn't unique to Britain, by the way, this was, this cycle was going on everywhere. In Germany, it was summer and coal. Um, you know, in, in Italy, it's it's the uh, the rise of uh, the, the final victory of, of who is it? El, El Diva, I forget his name. Andriotti. Um, in in the U.S., it's it's Carter and then Reagan, right? This this new departure, the return of America to its roots, to its its true self, and then that runs its course. And it's time for the next phase of, you know, the kinder, gentler, or, you know, the peace dividend for uh, the passing of the torch to a new generation and all that kind of stuff. So what's interesting is we do think that way. We're just not aware of it. In the same way that, you know, we do in the back of our heads hear music all the time. We just don't always listen to it. But, you know, when you're in that elevator and you hear a hum, I, I don't know about you, maybe I'm, I'm insane like Schumann, but I can't help it. Immediately, I'm like, oh, that sounds like Verdi. It's not. It's just elevator music. It's just elevator sounds, in fact. It's not even music. But you, 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 you put a pattern into it. And it's the same thing with history or linear time. I think the smart approach is the Yogi Berra approach of when you come to a fork on a case-by-case -case basis, decide what is going to help us, not just politically because politically is whatever it is but and here we're getting to the real issues of of, of art and and uh and culture but spiritually we have deep and profound spiritual needs we feel vulnerable in the universe as, as well we should we are vulnerable in the universe and we need things to give us a sense of uh of confidence and perspective because when you're nervous and you're scared it's natural to lash out. And so getting that perspective, you're not the first ones who've been here. We've been through this before. You get through it again. Worse has happened. Worse will happen. Better has happened. Better will happen. Uh, it's not all bad and it's not all good. Um, allows you to sort of breathe and, and get a, a larger um, uh, view of things and, and makes it more endurable because I, I see people trying to change the world dramatically and, and um, noble, heroic. I mean, I, I think of young Greta Thunberg, but she is like Joan of Arc. She's going through a profound spiritual crisis and the people around her are just totally oblivious to it. Um, it's, you know, 
and and it's very interesting. I think she's a very interesting person. I'm, I'm I find her very compelling. But um, people think it's like, well, she's talking about a very serious issue. There is a very serious issue in there. Don't get me wrong, absolutely. But she's approaches it like Joan of Arc. She's trying to save the world. Well, if we're going to be really secular, guys, you're not saving the world. The world's in no danger. The world will eventually die. The sun will supernova. It's inevitable. And everything will die with it unless we build a Dyson sphere. Right? But if we have hideous, the worst global warming in the world that you can imagine, it's no danger to the world. The world, world is indifferent. Truth be told, if you know geological history, it used to be a lot hotter on this planet and a lot more carbon. All that meant was there were a lot more life. What you really want to say is, this is going to be really hard on humans. Well, now you're getting somewhere. Even there, that's not entirely true. I'm telling you, if you live in Saskatchewan, Canada, global warming is the best thing could happen. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. If you live in Texas, it's not going to be so good. But if you live in the fjords of Norway, guys, there was a medieval warming before the mini ice age that took over in the, uh, I guess the 16th century. This really probably starts 14th century, ends right after the Napoleonic Wars. They used to sell English wine on the continent. I mean, it was really good. That's how warm it was. Now, I'm not saying we should do anything. Cool. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying, what do we see from this perspective that we've been laying out? We're seeing people are projecting onto politics, cosmic and spiritual concerns. And that's understandable, but I think it raises the iliotic question. Why? Why are you trying to save the world? The world's not in danger. You're trying to overcome centuries of racist oppression. You know, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> you know, this is the old James Joyce line from, from uh, um, Ulysses. You know, you're trying to undo the burden of history. History is the nightmare from which I'm attempting to awake. You know, 400 years of oppression. Hey, there are no 400-year-old people. They're all dead. That happened before. No one alive did that. No one alive experienced it. Real problems? You bet. Why are you so excited about it? Well, you're excited about it. People are excited, concerned, deeply moved. Because, again, the, the, this is not um, uh, <laughs> um, um, my, my, my friend Iliad. This is the, the uh, philosopher Alistair McIntyre. Because you're trying to fill a God-sized hole. I don't mind that. I mean, I prefer art. Boy, politics is a blunt on object to fill God-sized holes with. <laughs> it really is. It doesn't work out well. That's my sense. And, and it's in, in part because... You know, there is this narrative out there that um, God is dead and religion is, is, is gone. Well, okay, maybe God's dead. I'm not so sure about that. God's dead for eggheads like us. Um, religion is certainly <laughs> not, uh, in, in Western Europe is on the decline. Uh, but spirituality isn't. When you poll people who say, I don't go to church and I don't... Uh, but they all say, but I am spiritual and I do believe in God. That's really interesting. That's really profound. Um, and it suggests that those who would tell you they don't believe in God, they need something else to give them that, as you said, the, the, the crisis of meaning. And so you find it in whatever moral project you have. Moral projects are good things. The world would be a bad place if people didn't pursue them. When they become the source of your spiritual satisfaction, be very careful. One of the advantages of having received religions, and, uh, you know, Abhishek and I were, were talking about this, the reason why you can actually talk the RSS people off the ledge, if you get a chance to talk to them, is because they have an old received tradition in which people in the past had gone crazy with it, and it learned. It taught self-correcting mechanisms, right? Because people would say, 
I must fulfill my my uh, my my dharma. My uh, mind is artha. I must have power. I must have power and become the urodhana. And then you get the counter preaching. No, you don't. You don't have to do it that way, right? Um, what Ashoka learned, right? At a certain point, I, I've conquered all of India. I've got it. Maybe I should listen to the Buddhists. Maybe I should try uh, try some nonviolence for a while. Commerce might be better, and. So you, ha you have those traditions. When you don't have those and you just jump into politics, there's no break, nothing to constrain you um, without those, those older structures. So whether you think the religion is true or false is in a sense immaterial. It's rather that it's existed for so long that it learned how to constrain itself. If it hadn't, it would have burnt itself out by mass butchery. So um, just it, it, just adding on to this um, line of thought, uh, we, we spoke to um, Jonathan Pajot, who's a friend of John Levakey's, about um, what his thoughts were on this idea of um, spirituality without religion. And he said, um, oh, that's, that's just pride or something like this, that, that it's just my own spirituality, my own um, way of uh, looking at the world, something along those lines. He was saying that the word um, religion, which comes from the idea of um, religio, which is sort of linking, binding together, um, that what um, spirituality without a, a religio, without a binding to, to other people, um, how would you say, um, that that, that um, leaves someone who, who's trying to look for some source of meaning adrift. How, how do you think that um, we can bind back together in um, with with the sense of spirituality um, that yep. doesn't involve prideful um, or sort of self-directed behavior, but rather um, looking outward? Well, so there's a, a couple of things that first, um, I do think in mass, spirituality with religion it doesn't necessarily degenerate into hubris but it, it's just as easily degenerate degenerates into sort of faddishness new age you know healing power of crystals or or whatever um however i do think um it is possible let me say it's not spirituality without religion, but spirituality without orthodoxy. And that's a big difference. Um, almost all of the great mystics came from a particular faith. But almost all of the same myst all of the profound mystics uh, preach things that were very similar to the mystics of other faiths and very different from the orthodox of their faiths. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what, Abhishek and I were talking about before with the uh, with the the bhakti yoga, which is at some level Krishna says you should worship me and love me, but realize if you worship Yahweh or you worship Allah, it's all good. That's still me. It's the worshiping that counts. It's not just the worship, but the love. Um, I do think where uh, organized cult is useful is it reminds us that we are not the only ones who, as individuals who experience this, that others do as well, and that they, the difference between they and we is much smaller than we think. But, the, you know, that's also what you, you, what you need to be able to practice that intellectual charity, to say, you know, as much as I think this guy's a nutter, we're all nutters, so I should be able to see how he sees things too, you know? I mean, Rousseau, I'm going to be the natural man. Well, that's crazy, but then I'm crazy too, so who am I to judge? I'll try his crazy for a little bit. So so just to um, sort of push back on, on, on this a little bit, how do you get, because this is something that um, came up in our discussion with um, Dr. Sukru and um, in sort of subsequent discussions that you've had, he, he makes an emphasis on orthopraxy um, over orthodoxy. Um, how do you get from um, uh, how do you get orthopraxy without necessarily having orthodoxy, as you said, spirituality without orthodoxy? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and that is actually also one of the things um, Iliad talks about, which is that, and I've talked about this in my, some of my own um, uh, history too. One of the 
challenges we face as eggheads is that when we look at something like, and, and I, I use the word egg, eggheads affectionately because I'm, I'm one too, <laughs> is um, when we um, think about um, religion, uh, we tend to be primarily interested in doctrine. Mm. So, you know, we think about Catholics with the doctrine of transubstantiation, Protestants have consubstantiation, sola gratis, sola fide, whatever the doctrine is. But the vast bulk of people who practice the religion do so liturgically. So, uh, and sometimes you can see it in, in very big and popular faiths, there's a real tension where the intellectuals, because that's who runs churches, um, they're learned, uh, are preaching or, or stressing uh, a doctrine. And the masses, if you want them to show up, you better give them the liturgies they want. So, um, you know, the American um, grandson, great-grandson of, of, uh, of John Adams, uh, Henry Adams wrote about this, about an essay on, 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 on this in his travels in Europe. And he said, it's something really interesting. Uh, the Catholic Church had, <laughs> you know, Latin Christendom, the, the church had for the longest time stressed the sacrality of uh, Christ and the apostles and the exalted position of, um, of Simon Peter right, as, as the man who holds the key, keys to the kingdom of heaven, because it's through apostolic succession that the, that the church is organized. But he said, when you got that mat, that explosion of wealth in the late Gothic period, um, due to the medieval warming, he didn't know that, um, and, and people just started throwing up cathedrals. They all threw it up to the same person. It was never St. Peter's. It was never St. John's. Everyone not to dumb. Read those scriptures carefully. She's not in there. Where's she from? This cult of Mary. Birth, renewal. What have peasants been praying for from 10,000 BC to today? It's a Gaia that gives birth to the, to new, the new season, the new year. That's cyclical. If you wanted your church to, did you not want that cathedral? If you want it, it will be Notre Dame. It will be Our Lady. And the, the church got really smart after that and realized, you know, this isn't what we believe, but it's what they believe. And so that is the body of Christ. And I think that's orthopraxy, right? That you, you engage in the rituals uh, which are imbued with meaning and which are uh, um, surrounded by stories, right? The Easter story, the tale of Pentecost, the epiphany, um, the birth of Christ, this, the, the, the flight into Egypt, depending on, on your faith. It may be the, the, uh, the flight to Medina, uh, the return to um, the Hajj to, uh, to, to Mecca. You know, it might be you know, the celebration of Holi or, or, or whatever it is that, that, that frames you, it takes you out of your historical moment briefly to experience a so, sort of living time out of time in the, in the time of ritual. And that leaves you sort of refreshed and renewed. And it also does tie you uh, to the people you went through that with. The more real you take that, those rituals, um, what that does is it takes so much of the energy, your psychic energy, and by putting it in there, you're pulling it out of other things. So you're pulling it out of, well, I didn't get the raise I wanted. Well, is that really so important in the cosmic scheme of things? I didn't get, you know, uh, my letter to the editor published. Oh, is that really that important when we think about Christ rising from, from the dead? I didn't, my candidate wasn't elected. My team didn't make it to the finals. Uh, West Tottenham stinks again. These things happen, right? I mean, it, it puts it in, in, a, in a different perspective and takes some of the the pressure off of, quote, history. Mm. Yeah, just um, on top of that, we were um, just to reference our, the sort of, um, one of my favorite points from our 
conversation with um, Michael Zagru um, was that uh, we talked about the parable of the Good Samaritan um, and this, this idea that um, the person who is outside of um, the, the ritual, um, the, 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 the Samaritan um, who, who um, helps um, the, the traveller who is beaten up at the side of the road, as opposed to the people who do obey these um, uh, dogmas and orthodoxies. Um, you know, this this is, I, extends the notion of um, who is sort of uh, within the, the, the body of Christ. This this um, idea that people who um, you know are, don't necessarily share all of these you know <laughs> correct beliefs, these orthodoxies, um, you know, might um, also be practicing the right thing, and um, that's something that extends the. Um, how do you say this? This uh, notion of uh, love your neighbor as, as yourself. I think. Yeah, and, I, and 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 it's important because there's two senses of belief. Um, there is one sense of belief which is um, these are the doctrines I hold and the account I would give of them, and that's that's the priestly idea of religion. That's fine, you know. And for you know the, the learned, that's what interests us, and that's that's terrific. But there's another sense of belief, which is the um, faith and, <laughs> and things unseen, which is less about the head and more about the heart. And um, it's that which has a more, uh, I would say for most people, spiritually meaningful dimension to it. And it also can be a very, I think for some people, very improving characterologically. Um, because to accept things that one doesn't understand and not to insist that they're true, but to live on them because that's the decision I've made and it's what gives me spiritual solace and comfort is to accept one's limitations. That's, that's the first step, I would argue, towards civility is the, um, that sense of you know something which again uh, the people who are historicists and are freaking out now because they've got to save the world um one's tempted to ask and it, it's very easy for me i work in the enlightenment that's my period uh the anglophone enlightenment in particular and their great contribution was you know what's going to make you a good person when i teach you this fundamental thing you don't know you have a lot of opinions, but very few of them do you actually know. You know math and you know logic. You have probable reasons to believe what you teach in the science class. Everything else is measured to the evidence. They're good opinions and worse opinions, but they're all opinions. And that's what makes you enlightened. Because if you accept that you don't know, you can still fight for whatever your cause is, but you know perfectly well the guy who fights against you could be right. So keep fighting for what you're fighting for, but no, he's going to fight for what he is, is going to fight for. And just as you wouldn't want him to kill you for your heresy, don't kill him for his heresy. Find a way to fight where you don't kill each other. We call it voting. <laughs> no, it's literally what it is, right? That, that's the answer. Think about it, guys. If you knew the answer to a political problem, why? I mean, knew it, like you know the gravitational constant, like you know 2 plus 2 equals 4. If you knew it, why in heaven's name would you allow there to be voting? I mean, what an irresponsible, selfish, childish thing to do. There's a truth and a falsehood, and you're going to vote about it? You vote about quantum physics? No. Well, no, but think about that. Then why do we vote? Because we don't know. Labor thinks this will work better. The Tories think that will work better, but neither of them knows it. So they make the best argument they can to the public. They make a decision. When they say, well, we won, it's a turning point, walk away. It's a guess. We're trying your way. If it works, we'll stick with it for a while. If not, we'll try the other thing. My guess is, like everything else, nothing will work perfectly and nothing will work horribly. So you'll wind up being Yogi Berra too. 
<laughs> so try it for a while and you try something else. And if you didn't, you'd either have found the answer to history. And if you do, please share it. And if you, or you've gone crazy. I mean, I don't see much of a, from an enlightened perspective of a middle ground. And when you say, I mean, this is starting to show up. I don't know if you've got it there over here, where people are starting to say there's certain things you shouldn't be able to argue. You shouldn't be able to say. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what's, what the heck is that? <laughs> I mean, I don't believe them. I mean, they're they're ugly, but so what? I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff I don't believe, and I don't ban it. I mean, I would never d demand that people ban Quentin Tarantino movies. I think they're, you know, I've seen our Andre Tarkovsky, <laughs> right? I've seen Stanley Kubrick. Please don't talk to me about Tarantino. But if you like it, you like it. And you may think that it's really boring. That's cool. That's fine. We can have an interesting conversation about it if we don't get upset. Mm -hmm. If we could bring that same, I mean, one of the reasons why I think you got that in the meaning crisis in the late 19th century, the movement of moving meaning from politics to art, part of the motivation for that was that you wouldn't fill as many mass graves. Because if politics is the answer, I'm sorry, Mao is right. All political power comes from the barrel of a gun. If you don't have a gun, you don't have power. Right? You tell me I have to pay my, my, uh, my tax, and I say, well, you're going to resolve that not by a conversation, but by taking me to jail. And if I say I'm not going, I see the gun, don't I? Mm. So, you know what I'm saying? It's that, that's one reason why there was that attempt to move meaning out of the, the realm of geopolitical um, uh, context. It's very tempting to put it back in because that's how you rally support. That's how you rally people up to fight for the sacred. I'm not saying that that's never appropriate. I mean, I've heard the wonderful, uh, um, you know, Churchill speech of, of uh, you know, we'll fight them on the beaches. Very moving. And it's world historical. Um, there, again, Yogi Berra, there are moments when that is necessary and appropriate. Um, the problem is it gets to be addictive. <laughs> you start doing it. Oh, this is the struggle of our times. <laughs> oh, and everything is the struggle. We have to get those yellow lines painted on the streets. It's the struggle of our time. Okay. We'll survive. They have to stay white for a while. It wouldn't kill us. Mm. Uh, that's my sense from 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 an from an aging old guy. You know that. <laughs> yeah, you all need to chillax a little bit, guys. You know, um, <laughs> it, n no one has has solved the cosmic problem of of politics. And um, again, sometimes it has to be done, and you have to ramp it up. But when you're ramping it up all the time, I think that speaks to exactly what you pointed out from the previous speaker, a crisis of meaning. Um, and it's funny, there's a guy in the States who's, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, John McWhorter, he's a professor at Columbia University. A very, very sharp guy, I mean, smart. And he's, he's not the first to say this, but he said, you know, a lot of the current ideological ferment in universities is essentially religious. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it's deep. I think it's, a, it's profound. I think that my issue with McWhorter is he says it like, therefore, we can dismiss it. You know, this is not serious. And I'm not saying that I do think that these ideas are wonderful. I'm, I'm leaving that aside. I'm bracketing it. I'm saying you've missed, you, you saw something incredibly profound and you didn't ask the next question. What does it mean that highly educated, highly sensitive, deeply caring and good people feel the need to cook up a ideological religion. What does that suggest about our, quote, secularity, about the stability of our secularity? And I think that leads right to Iliada, which is to say that you're asking people to do something to carry a burden that they can't, right? That you took away Santa Claus from poor Greta when she was a little girl, and you took away God, and you took away every horizon that was bigger than this. And all she could find was polar bears. 
but you have to find something because otherwise you're just living this utterly, you know, you're J. Alfred Prufrock. You're, you're a hollow man. And who wants to live that? Thank God she didn't. She became Joan of Arc. But no one's asking that deeper question, which is what's going on with our, not our culture in general, but our high culture, that people have these deep spiritual needs that they're not getting met. Um, in normal and it's not that there's anything wrong with new religions it's just that new religions are like new narcotics or new drugs or new alcohols which are wonderful we all need psychoactives when you have a new one it takes several generations before you stop killing yourself taking it right it takes a long time i'm seeing this in the united states they're legalizing pot all over the place really cool well, but they've been smoking bong in um, the subcontinent of Asia forever. They don't have kids tripping out because they ate a whole lot of bad stuff and you have to pump their stomachs. Why? Because they've done it forever and they know how to take it safely. Mm. Generations. Same thing when we first developed distilled liquor. This is early American history, you know, the so-called... Yeah, you got all the 16, 19 boys. It's a good thing she doesn't know anything. She would have really, because it's not about the slave. Slavery itself is a reflection of a bigger need. And that was the distilling revolution. Europeans had lived on mostly beer, the wealthy on wine, for a long time. In the late medieval period, Benedictines figured out how to distill spirits, but they did it making cognac and brandy from wine. So very, very expensive. And you could only use it for medicinal purposes because of the cost. Imagine what happens when you're cooking up cane and someone, cane sugar, someone lets it cook too long and it ferments. And out comes rumbago, right? And the whole world gets drunk because that rum, the beauty of the beer was it's social. You have rounds. I, we all drink a beer, takes us like 10, 15 minutes to put that pint down, get another one. It's a lot of filling your belly before you got a good tank on. Put that rumbago down. In 45 seconds, you're on the floor. <laughs> mm -hmm. It took a long time for Europeans to learn how to drink that without killing themselves, beating their wives, abusing their children, and mangling themselves in machinery a very long time. That's true of every narcotic. It's the reason why Americans, when they discovered peyote, jumped off buildings. You never see Amerindian jump off buildings. They take it all the time. Why? They've taken it for centuries. They know you do not take it on your own. You take it in a sweat lodge with someone who's older than you, who's done it before, who can look after you if you have a bad experience. You'll be fine. Do not do this on your own. It's not recreation. Right? Same, same is true of every faith system. It needs to go through its period of maturation to learn to control itself, to learn to accept things outside of itself. What are you going to do with people who are not of the faith? It will take a while to figure out how to engage with them without taking the original view of the Hebrews, which is just kill them all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, get them all of them, all of them, all of them, all of them. But you see, if you read the scriptures, they're not doing that. After a while, they don't do that anymore. They're like, well, we'll set up trading relations with you. And occasionally we'll marry, we'll intermarry with you. So you get Samaritans who are not Jews, but they're Jews. They practice the Jewish religion, they're just not Hebrews. There's that right? There's that beautiful image in um, the, uh, I think it's chapter three of um, Hosea, when, when there's um, a, a metaphor of um, Israel who's sort of, um, you know, uh, the, the, this um, like slept with lots of different um, gods, that's sort of the image of the prostitute. Um, and uh, Hosea the prophet um, is told by God to go and love his wife, who is, who is a prostitute. And, and there's this image of like, you know, that he, despite um the the um the, the nation of god sort of like just uh disobe disobeying you know all, all these sort of like um orthodoxies and this kind of thing that that um that uh there's still should be that spirit of love there um for the outsider um and i i, I want to just sort of wrap things up if this could 
um, be an, a way to understand um, the relationship between orthodoxy and orthopraxy, which is to have orthodoxy as the sort of um, uh, limiting uh, uh, factor on something like the religious patterns that are quite dangerous in themselves, to have something to, to limit that. Um, and, and not necessarily as a, as a way to um, separate the inside from the outside and to hate the outside and to love the inside. Yeah, uh, you know, there's a, a, a very interesting um, uh, teacher in late 19th, early 20th century by the name of Ramakrishna. And um, some, some Hindus believe he's actually an avatar, an incarnation of, of God on earth. He's an historical figure and people met him and talked to him. And he went through a very interesting phase, series of phases in his life uh, when he realized that he was, you know, a devout, um, I think Vedanta uh, uh, practicing Hindu. One phase is um, he becomes a Muslim and he practices Islam for a while in an orthodox fashion. And then when that's done, he comes back to being a, a, a Hindu and then he becomes a Christian for a while. And he won't shut up about Jesus. He comes back to practicing for a while. And then he comes, then he becomes a woman. He lives life as a woman for a while. He wears women's clothing, does women's jobs, comes back. And at the end, you know, he's asked, so, you know, um, which are you? And he said, well, I'm a Hindu. I'm all of them, of course. They, They all tell the same story. They all have the same practices. If you want to focus and narrow, you can. But he had a very mystical um, idea, which is, you know, it's like you wear a lot of different suits of clothing during the year, which is your true suit. It's still you under there. And we might think of these um, different uh, orthodoxies as different um, wrappings. But we, I think for most people, I think Professor Guru is right. For most people, you experience what's vital in religion more in, in practice, whether that's meditation or almsgiving or singing hymns together or dancing. And I, and I really, so, <clears throat> you know, to jump back to what does it mean that you know, people don't have this meaning, I think a lot of it has to do with the failure of our religious institutions they think that the way to get people engaged is to be um, relevant to contemporary issues. Oh my goodness, why don't you just burn your churches to the ground? Exactly the opposite. You want to deal with your own perennial teachings in a contemporary setting. So you want to do the opposite. You want to preach Christ crucified, for example, if you're you know, a Christian, that's what you should be preaching, Christ crucified and resurrected, but then tie it into the experiences we have today. And if and if people don't find that the beauty of that reflected in, say, Gregorian chants or in high church vespers, why not do it with a folk dance? Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with playing a little guitar and singing, a, I don't know, a David Bowie song or whatever. You know, there's there's nothing written in stone that says you have to have the particular vestments you do. And then the way we'll stay stay relevant is, you know, we'll talk about, um, you know, whatever is the the, the current issue of of the day, uh, global warming or whatever. No, you talk about your own issues, keep them relevant to the present. Right. How how are you? uh, um, how, How are we all crucified each day? And how are we resurrected? How do we sometimes suffer uh, for others? Do they bear our sins? And once you do that, you can say, look, you see these patterns over and over and over again, because the claim that we can live without them is a bluff. It really is. You know, think, what is what are the most notorious atheist regimes of the 20th century, right? Nazis and communists. But Nazis believe that they're recovering the long lost civilization of Atlantis, right? They're going deep back in time and rebuilding harmony with the earth. 
I mean, this is really modern and secular? This is Bronze Age. My, my Marxist friends, they're fighting for the global proletarian revolution. The proletariat being the class that suffers in an unlimited way. And its suffering will redeem humanity permanently. Oh, please. Oh, please. I mean, you just put the cross up. And, you know, and put a working class cap on it. I mean, you're done. Right? This is... You're modern and secular. You couldn't bear being to be modern and secular would be ultimately, and historicist would be to say, you know, stuff happens, and it's not heading anywhere, and it's stuff happens till it doesn't, and eventually it's supernovas. Who wants to live that? <laughs> I mean, really, you know, that's why we create meaning and beauty. It, it, it's in the same way that you move into an apartment and you wouldn't leave it unfurnished. Are your furnishings artificial? Of course they are. They're man-made. You picked them. They're arbitrary. It could have been a divan. It could have been a sofa. It could have been whatever. A recliner. You know, a beanbag chair. It doesn't make any difference. You pick. But once you put it in, you have structure to your living space. So it is with all of your beliefs. Mm. And to say, well, but they're not... The universe is uh, uh, furniture. Well, neither is the stuff in your house. But you don't throw it out. You wouldn't think of living without it. So that's, you know, I don't know if that's quite a bit of praxy, but 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 that's that's that, that that that's the sense I have, which is you know, um, again to go back to McWhorter, I think it's deep. I think it's profound. I I love listening to him. I could listen to him forever and ever and ever. But there's a part of me that's like, gee, dude, don't you feel any compassion for these people? I mean, I know you think they're crazy. They're crazier than loons. Fair enough. Maybe they are. But they're not bad people. What does it mean that they embrace crazy? Might it be that they have a deep need and it's not being met and it's not their fault? They're young people. They didn't make this world. So anyway, that's what middle-aged people do, though. <laughs> we blame young people. So. <laughs> yeah, cycles, well, cycles. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's a lovely place to sort of draw things to a close. Um, just this idea of um, furnishing your mind with beauty as a way to sort of solve the crisis of meaning. Um, uh, one more question. Could you say quickly there as well? I think the biggest fact check you'll get tonight is that there was ever good English wine. That's probably <laughs> seen as a very controversial statement. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, at least it was exported. <laughs> right? this is, this is, and, and, and that tells you something because they weren't exporting porter at the time, just and, or the ale, just the wine. So, and it wasn't elderberry wine; it was real wine. So, no, it. it, it Again, people know that Europe was, at least Northern Europe, significantly warmer um, towards the uh, um, end of the, basically the, the uh, end of the Dark Age. And it, um, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's the same as what's going on right now, but there are cycles within cycles and there have been cycles before and there'll be cycles again. So mm. I'm not saying it was good wine. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I, I want to be invited to a French event, so I'm not saying it was good wine or an Italian event, even better. And I'm certainly not praising your cuisine. I would definitely want to be invited to an event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Take really care. Wonderful. Thank you so much.